this is it. I'm going to stop for Q&A um, and stop sharing my screen. Great. Go back on video. I think we have plenty of time to to take lots of questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zepis. This is very, very interesting, very helpful. A lot of uh, good advice already. And uh, I mean, I think folks can put in your question on the in the chat, but uh, I will start off because uh, we have a, a lot of uh, questions already asked um, or prepared before. And so when you talk about, uh, I'm quite interested in the, when you mentioned AI product, and when you think about this term, um, a lot of people talk about AI solutions, right? Like they build a, um, a model for a very specific task and solve a problem. Then when a different problem come up, they need a different solution or a different model. Or do, you, do you see any differences between AI product versus AI solutions or they're really the same thing? Can, can you comment on that? Okay. Well, um, a solution can be, say, you're providing a solution and your solution can be living in a PowerPoint. Say, I'm going to... Um, solve the problem of, um, I, I know what bad players are like in healthcare. I can tell you the characteristics of, of fake providers that are submitting claims and making it more expensive for everyone. Um, that's a solution. And I can present it in a PowerPoint and tell you, here's my solution. They all, you know, have multiple addresses. They, um, have you know more than this many claims each of the claims has more than this many lines or whatever it is that, that my model created right here's a solution um it's not a product because you didn't put it in production to me mm -hmm. if it's in production if it's doing something it's a product um and i know it's kind of similar you're right it, it could be similarities to the two terms but a product in the business world means more than that, it's um, there are product categories for each of the. Say, United Healthcare has their own product categories. We have level one product categories and level two. You know, what are what what are we trying to um, create? What's the product we're giving to our customers, to our members, to our providers, or whoever? Right. So, to me, anything that's in production, by definition, is a product, and um, I'm not a product person. <laughs> per se. So maybe if somebody else knows a little bit more about it can um, chime in and, and give a definition. But to me is, it has to be productionalized, therefore in prod, you can have a product that's a shirt that's being used, and you can have a survey on how well does that shirt fit the purpose of an exercise garment, right? Uh, an exercise, you know, uh, shirt, right? Um, and so say I produce a shirt, and it's you know, super thick cotton and people are exercising and getting really um, unpleasant experiences because it sticks to them. And, but I, we have another product that we're monitoring and getting feedback on because that's more of a workout shirt sure, that is, you know, um, you know, shows the lack of my knowledge about um, materials for exercise, but it's like, you know, it breathes better, let's say that, right? So if I have, um, if I am creating a solution, I would just have a shirt and I don't really care about anything. If I create a product, I know I have a product. I'm going to keep an eye on, on my users. I'd like feedback on how like they like that product. And I might have product updates. Say my thick cotton shirt got feedback that it's too thick. I'm going to make it thinner. I got feedback that's still sticking um, and not unpleasant to work out and I'm going to go try to mix in some other fabric to make, you, you know, so in my mind, that's, that's the difference. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this explains it well or not. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's, uh, we actually had a, another uh, guest lecture a few weeks back and talk about the, uh, specifically ML ops, right? So if you think about mm -hmm. this production, how to maintain the model, mm -hmm. 
monitoring the model performance, all those uh, standard yeah. practices can be quite, I mean, think of that way, it seems uh, aligned with what you're saying here. And another uh, related question I had is for this AI product, do you see any differences than building a software product or what, what are the significant yeah. challenge like building an AI product versus mm -hmm. a software? Yeah, product? there are differences. You're right. But uh, is anybody familiar with software 2.0 um, terminology? It was very popular about a couple of years ago um, where we're using AI to create software Software 2.0 is eating the world. Andre, Andre Karpat, you know, there's like a, a lot of excitement about it. But basically, I think of AI as um, software 2.0 product in a lot of ways, right? Because we, when you create a model, it's going to end up being coded someplace, right? So it's an AI software. Mm -hmm. um, you can think of it as um, it's it's a software product that solves a problem utilizing AI methodology, right? So, but it ends up being software, right? And so will, would you be putting, a, you know, a, your code in production, if you're just a software developer, not doing AI, you wouldn't be putting in production without uh, it being vetted, right? You're gonna have code review before anything goes into prod, you're gonna have people going to test it, stress test it, and all kinds of stuff, right? Same with AI. AI software is a software product. And the difference is that you need to monitor it a little bit differently. Because regular AI software, right, you would get, oh, you know, feedback as far as we have bugs, these are reported bugs, people are reporting on these things, and we need to fix them, right? Whereas for AI, you want to monitor it constantly. And I'll give you an example. I led, um, a data science um, team, what was called commercial data science team, where I was a part of Optum Payment in Integrity previously, and we had outside clients. So Optum is selling payment integrity to outside plans, Blue Shield of California, Kaiser, whatnot. So um, they would send us our data. My team was creating the predictive models and maintaining them. And we actually had contractual agreements of how much in medical cost savings, how many dollars is AI going to save the client? We mm -hmm. had to provide that much in medical cost savings. Not only that, we had to make sure our provider abrasion was low. What does that mean? That means we're um, annoying providers in common terms. What does that mean? Well, we're asking, we're stopping their claim, we're pending their claim, asking them to provide medical records. So we can vet and make sure that we should pay it or pay that much or that it's not duplicate or that you know it's not um, upcoding or unbundling or, or, or other things, right? So that would make the provider have to stop what they're doing in their busy day and then send us their medical record. And then after that, there is a team that kind of reviews the medical record, reviews what's in the claim and says, yes, pay it or no partially pay it or you know, deny it. We've already seen a similar claim, it's a duplicate or whatever. And that would cause provider abrasion. So it was really interesting that we, you know, your AI software was not only in production, but it had to produce so much in business value in amounts of, in dollar amount and to be accurate enough to not make the end user, you know, do things that are not, you know, unnecessarily, right? Send us medical right unnecessarily. And so that all happened during COVID. So if we did not have our performance monitoring in place, not only would we have gotten in trouble with our clients, you know, contractually we wouldn't have been able to produce as much. Um, we would have made our you know, MPS go down because they would be unhappy because their providers for these plans are then calling them and complaining that we are stopping their claims, asking for medical record. So it would have been really um, an avalanche of negative things if we didn't watch it. We watched it. We daily knew exactly what was going on, how our models were performing. 
and we were able to quickly we didn't we were not able to retrain the models because we didn't have the data on COVID, right? That COVID was new. We had no idea what that meant and what was going on, but we were able to put in dampeners and, you know, kind of guide the output of our models so it doesn't spew out nonsense because it's never seen that data in the training data, basically. Mm -hmm. So to me, I mean, I've seen it work. If, if you don't know what your AI product is doing, your AI software is doing, you can get in trouble, you know, maybe for some other applications, it's not that drastic, but we would have to pay penalty, you know, contractually, you know, are, we're bound to produce so much and so on. And just imagine if we just had everybody have to send in medical records during COVID, right? right stop right. what you're doing. We've never seen it. We don't know our models confused, but you still need to stop and send us your medical, you know, while trying to save lives. So. A, a lot of benefits of really knowing what your AI product is doing. Yeah, this is a very good point, right? A lot of this uh, AI model depends on the assumption that the past is a similar representative of future, right? If it's mm -hmm. something changed, whether it's data distribution or in this case, a brand new disease, right? That then obviously the pattern will be different mm -hmm. than to the old yeah. model trained on the old data will the be behavior suspicious. Exactly. Right? Yeah. what's happening here yeah. that's a very very interesting uh point that's always keep happening right yeah. and um maybe we can take some of the, the question from the chat and some are kind of uh, related things i want to discuss as well maybe what, what, like from, i'm external folks right i think george asking that question right if we we, we think oh we have our students or myself or we have some great AI models, or we think all this is, could help, uh, um, like, let's say, United Healthcare to solve some problem. Is it, I felt it's probably quite difficult to approach uh, external organization. Right? I think George was saying a lot of the healthcare organization don't have the, I guess, the, the competency in AI internally. So it's hard to have that conversation with them. How, how do you approach selling some AI solution or mm -hmm. product to- yeah. Great uh, question. Mm -hmm. sort of party, right? So um, yeah, by the way, that's a misconception. We have a lot of, uh, like within United Health Group, a ton of people are doing AI, really good experts. People from came from Google, Amazon, all over yeah. the place. Like um, the, so right that's changing, concerned. by the yeah. way. Mm -hmm. However, I think you're spot on, George. A lot of the leaders, the leadership, does not fully understand what AI is. So what you need to do is you need to speak business when you try to sell your model or product to anybody, right? And first of all, why shouldn't you? You guys are super bright individuals in grad school, you know, you, you know the field. Why not benefit from, from the work that you're doing, right? Because somebody else will when you publish it. <laughs> Uh, somebody else will, and my, why not be you? So I really like what you're saying. You should be trying to do that. Now to sort of um, break this barrier between um, senior leadership and some huge Fortune 5 company, for example, or or some other senior leadership maybe does not understand what what this product would do for them, you have to make it easy for them to grasp it. Think about having a one slide that clearly specifies what's in it for them. Why should they even talk to you? What's the problem you're trying to solve? Say um, $1 billion is used on manual processes in your organization, right? That's the problem. And then you clearly say, we can utilize your historical data to um, learn from it and solve you estimated X amount of dollars to do that in an automated way. Um, but know that they probably know a lot about their processes, but they don't understand your craft. They don't understand AI per se. So you might have to really um, explain it at a fifth grade level, very simply, without any big words, avoid any um, you know, um, machine learning, stats, jargon that nobody outside of your domain would understand. So go go 
in it with here's the problem and how much it's costing you, here's the solution and how much it's gonna save you, right? And make it be super clear. And um, if you can sort of specify who, wore, who <laughs> what, where, when, and how will use the model and the why, the benefit, in a super clear, concise, easy to understand for a fifth grader way, the better you will be off. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, George. You help yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great advice. Thank you. Um, you know, often the, the argumentation for an AI project, there is already a hypothesis or a problem which you want to solve. <clears throat> and uh, um, and this is usually, you know, because you work with a clinician, so it has to be something to do with the, the care delivery, and then you are interested in the business impact. And so, and then it is about how do you get those numbers you are talking about, you know? <clears throat> and uh, often the, the, the system does not know those, that do, they do not have those numbers because the reporting is not set up for that. So if I, as a, let's say, an AI researcher who actually want to use, uh, utilize and deploy AI, for me, it would be important already in the, in the interview with the healthcare system before I start my job to ask the right question, is the organization actually ready for me? Because if not, I spend there a year, one and a half year lose time uh, because I don't have a lobby there. No one will understand me what I'm doing. You know, Even the, the one slide doesn't help me. Because the, the, the second point is then, let's say I have an AI solution, I have it developed, it is peer reviewed, it is, uh, we have a good data set. So the organization does not know how to deploy it and run it. And who makes the decision you know, within the organization? Because the, the governance for that, the internal government doesn't exist yet. You know, It's a rural hospital, they want to use AI, but then suddenly, okay, here we have the result, the, the AI gives us uh, a group of people we have to screen, and now we should screen uh, for cancer, and now we have to invest. So who makes the decision? So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about um, how do I identify very all, early on when I talk to a healthcare system that what I can deliver or what I can bring, bring in can actually be realized, and I can be successful in that you know, basically in that company or in that healthcare system? It's a, you know, it varies based on the organization. So if mm. you're, if you're talking about United Health Group, it's a Fortune 5 company with people on 20, in 22 countries, you know, has ma major business units, you know, Optum Health, um, Optum um, Insight, Optum Bank, <laughs> Uh, Optum RX, um, Optum Labs, you know, healthcare proper from networking to, um, you know, we have a group of physicians, uh, Optum Health is a group of nurses and physicians, you know, giving medical care to United Healthcare proper, which is the, the creation of plans, networking, uh, UHC networking of plans to all kinds of stuff, adjudications, it's ginormous. It, for any of those applications, your answer would be different. The people that are making decisions, um, your um, you know, lobby or network um, would be different. So if you have, say, a model um, that solves some operational costs for some of them, um, and say, let's it, it's for adjudicating claims. Claims adjudication has a ton of manual processes, um, a ton of automation that automates processes, but all, also adds manual maintenance and um, it has you know technical debt and whatnot. And you say, okay, I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to replace all of your edits with a model or some type of edits with a model. We're working on that internally, but it's it's so wide you can do it anywhere. But let's say I'm gonna I have a pretty good model that's gonna solve this specific thing for your you don't have to have any of that manual or automation stuff. You just put it in, knows what to do, it's gonna save you money, right? 
well, say you find the right person to talk to and they're interested in it. Even then, they would say, yeah, but, you know, you can't actually use by, pol you know, there are certain policies and every state has a different policy. And right. so in the state of Kansas, sorry, in the state of, you know, Iowa or whatever, you, you can't, um, you know, you cannot, you have to have a human review every appeal. You can't automate that. And so what then, right? Then what you can say is you can be prepared for any of these kind of different tricky situations and say, okay, but my model can help that person with their efficiencies. It can be an efficiency tool for them. And so kind of having that backup as to there are going to be these um, bumps in the road wherever you go. Somebody will tell you, I can't use AI because. And if you have a backup plan, number one, to kind of be able to bounce right back and say, yeah, but they can use it as an efficiency tool. They, they can guide their answer. They're still making the answer, but I can give, give them all these, you know, like a flag. If they should cancel it, I give them, you know, a, a thumbs up or I give them a, you know, a probability score of what the output should be and tell them why that's going to be so useful for them. And they can, they can um, increase their um, throughput, hour throughput, you know, volume per hour or whatever they call that. Um, by 80% fold, I mean, threefold or whatever, you know. So having that in the back of your pocket, knowing that it's gonna be difficult is great. Knowing that wherever you go, it's gonna be a different situation. And at the end of the day, you're dealing with humans. You're gonna catch them on a, a mm. you know, cranky day, or you're gonna catch them on a good day. You have to be able to deal with that. You have to be able to, still your one pager will be a great start, but knowing that you're dealing with a human, you're selling them the product. Most people don't like to be attacked by salespeople basically you know, all day long. So taking right. that into consideration, not putting a, a hard sell, going into, um, yeah, this can be useful to you because the center of the slide tells them how much they're gonna save. At the end of the day, business value that your product will bring is what's gonna be the selling point, no matter, who you're talking to, whether you have the right folks, because even if you don't, they're going to connect you with Joe from operations, because that's going to really solve Joe's problems. Um, can, so I just, you, yeah. can I ask you one more question? Do you yeah. have, are you aware of any standards uh, like ITIL, the IT infrastructure library, or uh, the, the PMP standard, how to implement uh, an AI project, an AI product? So that from you can- MLOps. How, how is it called? From ML operations point of view, like how do you productionalize a model for them? Yeah, 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 yeah. A standard, so you know, something which has already uh, used in in different healthcare systems, so that you can approach you know your employer and say, okay, look, uh, this is already a proven standard. This uh, turned out to be best practice. Um, let's move on and 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 follow those guidelines. You know that you have a, a reference point and that you don't have to fight this entire uphill battle. Uh, if you want to deploy your your, your algorithm there, yeah. are you aware of a, such a standard or a best? No, practice? I think I think George, you should go develop that. That would be really useful. <laughs> yeah. MLOps is a really hard domain. I mean, it was just recently, as as you know, Doctor Sun, um, it was just recently kind of acknowledged that machine learning operations is important. We used to have a a data scientist that was supposed to be a data engineer, data scientist, and an ML engineer at once. Right, and we realized those are three different sets of skills. Um, now we have ML ops being done by people that understand architecture, understand the processes and where it should sit in the system and so on. No, there is no such standard. I mean, and, and I wish they, and I think maybe we should be, uh, we will be headed that way because it's definitely needed. But right now the big thing is on AI developer platforms that you can use to productionalize. So, you know, there are some of these um, companies that sell that, they're companies that build it internally for their own processes. It's, it's definitely eclectic. And I can tell you within just, you know, healthcare, ton of different application domains and it, it gets, think about it. Your model can sit within the adjudication highway or it can sit 
um, in the background of the website where you put stuff for your members, or it can sit in the sales and marketing department someplace where you're reaching out to new potential members. It's like, it's very different. And that's why it's so challenging to have a standard right now. I mean, maybe somebody will solve for all of that, but there's nothing that I know of that would solve for all that. But that would, you're right, that would be really good to have sometime in the future. So just want to make sure, uh... Do you, you have more time? Uh, we have a lot of questions, so we, we didn't go through, but if you have time. Um, let me just double check um, if I make sure. can, please. You can. Yeah, I can stay for five more minutes, absolutely. Um, there is one thing I wanted to chime in on the topic of you guys being in grad school. Um, and I promised that early on. Just use, use your research experience to benefit you if you end up in industry and vice versa. I've done it and it's really important. And I'll tell you why. Even if you end up in industry someplace, say you work for you know, healthcare, um, having, you know, having, um, ex having experience in innovation and research will definitely benefit you in trying to solve the business problems you have at hand and companies that don't invest in innovation are going to lag behind. Um, if you go from industry to research, bringing that grounding of I'm solving problems, I'm not, it's not um, a research effort just to publish papers or do this or that. I'm actually solving actual problems will ground your research as well. It'll be beneficial. So don't be shy of you know, kind of cross-pollinating the, the two domains. They're very much connected, more so than people think. That's just a piece of advice I wanted to give. So that, yeah, that's a very helpful. I mean, another, just follow up on George's discussion, right? Because we have a lot of, we're usually like outside this uh, real world industry, right? So we want to, um, at least uh, my uh, personal, I very much want to work with industry folks mm -hmm. because, I think we can offer some help, but also it's a lot for us to learn about the real world problems. And, but as you mentioned, right, those uh, organizations usually have internal team, right? For, I mean, for, for a big organization, for sure, they have data science, machine learning, or I mean, internal teams. Um, how do we, I mean, from your, your in that type of team, when the external, I mean, for me, my right, researcher or third party, vendors approach you guys do you see them as like a competitors or you think oh if they come this way yeah. this is helpful but yeah. if they keep doing this this is bad right? can, can you give some advice right from yeah. your perspective what will be a most productive engagement like external folks? right so i think like dr sun with our collaboration what you brought was an extensive um domain knowledge about specific types of models that my team didn't have right and we really enjoyed our collaboration because we you could advise us on on some of the along the steps of the what, what we wanted to do to solve that um, business problem internally so in general uh, a research an academic could bring that vast um, um, knowledge of of the domain that is maybe not necessarily available within the business unit you're collaborating with. Just, you know, just think of it as um, an awesome literature survey that you're bringing and just it, within your knowledge to, um, and then and just providing, you know, advice and direction into what else can be looked at. Now, you also could be building a solution for somebody, right? If right. they don't say they don't have, um, um, you know, large language model experience and you're bringing your expertise to that team because they're not experienced in that or just learning about it. They don't know much about it. You can actually provide a model or solution to solve their problem. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, you're almost like a, you know, you're a, a consultant, you're um, an external resource for them. So that's excellent. Um, but I think in general, I would say, um, academia has a wider um, theoretical knowledge about the domain and, you know, um, or you can innovate 
more easily probably than somebody on a standard regular team someplace else. You can come up with novel solutions. You can come up with a new, um, you know, retain version whatever to solve a specific problem that 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 team doesn't have to solve. Because because often you have to fine tune the solution, um, and you find have to fine tune um, the approach to to solve a problem, right? So um, mm -hmm. maybe no standard machine learning mo model can be used to solve that and you can create a new one. And then um, that would be very useful because maybe they don't have that expertise on the team. So I, I saw, uh, yeah, just, I know you, you don't have a, a lot of time here. I saw the Thomas asked a question. Maybe I will rephrase that uh, in, uh, in the context of a lot of this large language model development. So how, how do you see this uh, interaction between uh, human and uh, AI algorithm? How, how important um, is that part of the design, right? And um, and seems like the part of this chat GPT's uh, success has come from a very natural, simple interface, right? You can interact with uh, AI models right, with the natural language. Is, is that uh, the interaction somehow a, a key factor there we should think more about right, when we develop those uh, AI product? And if so, how do we evaluate that? Right? We have the yeah. standard accuracy, all those stuff. But in this type of interaction, are there some metrics we can think about? Yeah, so um, I think that's probably a really wise approach is to um, pitch your model as um, an efficiency tool for the human, right? Mm -hmm. So I think on your one pager, that would be a great thing because you're not going to go there and say, hey, I'm going to replace your humans. <laughs> uh, right. Rather, you're going to say, I'm going to make your humans more efficient and more accurate. And here's how. That's going to fly better and easier. You can replace them down the road for sure, and I don't mean to be sneaky, but you can prove to them down the road that you can um, you know, actually replace some of that and they can go focus on more, more complicated things, right? But if you tell them, this is um, an efficiency tool for your humans knowing which claims to investigate or um, knowing which claims to overturn because they're gonna end up at being appeals down the road or you know, something like that, or giving them um, a quick snapshot you know, it's a dashboard to tell them which which things to, like prioritizing their flow, which things to investigate first, because they're gonna be the most beneficial of their time. And if they don't get to the rest of them, it doesn't really matter, you can just pay them or whatnot. So having that, uh, pitching it as an efficiency tool or mm -hmm. an accuracy improvement tool is easier to swallow for some of these uh, decision makers to start with. Um, that's, that's and the, really pitching it as, hey, you have this much of your historical data. You have a ton of historical data. Are you using it? Are you maximizing the knowledge? You know, are you learning from the experience of your data? Are you going to be doing the same mistakes over and over again and going through them manually? I can speed that up for you. Here's how. I'll give you a tool that's going to flag all the bad things. And your humans just have to go through those. The rest, don't worry about them. Just, you know, push them through. They'll be more efficient. You'll be catching your things that are really important to you. And AI as an efficiency tool will bring you this much money, basically. That makes sense. I mean, the last very quick question, I know sure. you have to go. I always ask this question. I mean, I know you already give a lot of good advice to our students, right? So to inter you interact with a lot of data scientists in your daily jobs, right? What are the some unexpected and skills or ability that they have or the good ones they have and you can offer to our students like advice okay i mean yes this is yeah you have this skill that will be actually quite helpful for for uh, to become a top-notch data scientist in future i mean well um i think technical skills wise is just really learning how to deal with imbalanced data sets number one that happens so often, and I've seen it. I mean, that's one of my favorite interview questions, by the way, guys. If you ever interview with me, I'm going to be asking about it. Um, so that's a big one because in reality, data is very imbalanced. Um, and knowing how to adequately create a model that's going to be evaluated properly on imbalanced data is the way to go. Uh, number two, keep on learning. 
there's always something new. Um, like, you know, I had to, I had to learn about chat GPT and large language models, the details of Da Vinci and this and that abacus overnight, because I didn't know about it. I, I'm not really in that domain, but I want to know because I'm being asked. Um, so and I enjoy that. <laughs> And I was the first one when it was super hyped up early on to say, ah, I don't think we can use it for, I mean, I gave it a simple example of, I live in San Diego. My sister lives in Solana Beach. Our houses are 10 minutes away. I asked Chad GPT, hey, uh, how can I get from um, San Diego to Solana Beach? And he told me to use a coaster, which is this local train, because that's what he had the data on. It's 40 minute ride from one to the other, which is not even accurate. And I would have to drive there and park like nobody in their clear mind, unless they live by the station would take that as an option. Um, so it didn't have any, you know, any model is as good as the data used to build it, right? Didn't have any information about people just casually driving from their house in San Diego to Solana Beach. Plus San Diego is a huge metro area. If I lived at a South, it would take me a good 30, 40 minutes to get to my sister's house, but I live in the North and it takes me 10 minutes. And then I said, well, why not drive? And it says, yeah, driving is a good option too. It would take you a little longer though, an hour. I'm like, uh, not even in the worst rush hour traffic, unless the inter interstate's block would take me more than, you know, 20 minutes to get to my sister's house, like double the time, but that's it. So then I asked something else and then it totally um, it contradicted itself. It said, Dri hey, driving is a great option. And I said, but it takes me 10 minutes to drive. He's like, yeah, that's a great option. You should drive totally. Like, so that was my first example to chat GPT. And I just told everybody we can use it. There's like, like there is no concept of anything, right? It's just a text predictor. It's text generator. Predicts what it, what's coming next based on what you told it. There is no accuracy. I mean, sure, it can summarize some things. You have to be careful about use it. All that stuff it can be useful. It's useful a lot of ways, but it's not there yet to be used for like a search or give me my, uh, you know, information about this and that in, in a very accurate way. And I had to fight that, but internally anyway, because people were so excited. I'm like, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. Let's just be realistic. How would it know about it? I asked it, hey, what can Jad GPT do for my company? He gave me the spiel of, you know, like mm -hmm. marketing spiel. He right. said, hey, what can chat GPT do for me? Try it, guys. Well, it gave me the same thing. It can help with your customer service. Well, it doesn't have a concept that me is a person. I'm not my company. I don't have customers. I don't need customers. Like, come on. It's it's like, it's so um, in a lot of ways, it's very green. And I was able to assess that early, but I had to read about it. I had to play with it. I had to learn, right? I had to do a lot of stuff like that. Um, and I enjoy it because I enjoy learning, but um, that's my second advice. Keep on learning technically. As far as the other type of advice for any data scientist out there, guys, I know keyboard is our best friend. I was born that way too. I got to communicate a little bit more when I um, took up my first job out of grad school, which was um, I worked for a consulting company. I got offered a professor um, position and a consulting company position that paid twice as much. I went the route of the greed, <laughs> which made me learn how to communicate more, how to get people excited about what I'm doing. I had to get the clients excited about what I'm doing and stuff like that. My second piece of advice for you as far as the other type of skills is communication. Mm -hmm. Brevity, be brief, and be very clear as to what you're saying. Oftentimes, data scientists talk a lot, and I know I'm guilty of that. I'm still working on it. But clear, brief communication of what you're trying to tell them without big, confusing stats words is the way to go when you're in the workplace. Unless you're a professor or you're working for you know somebody that's a researcher and understands what you're saying, right, or somebody that has a lot of experience in that, I would just think of that brevity. Um, if your slide has a big paragraph full of text, that's not going to go well. People will skim through it and not really get. If you have clear, you know, bullets with bolded text with your key messages, that's extracting information and show it in a brief, concise way. So think about that. This is very helpful. Is I mean, this communication advice we have got. I mean, almost like every industry speaker give that. 
as like an additional data scientist should have that skill. Otherwise, yeah. it, it would not be yeah. effective. And uh, I totally agree. Brevity and, and concise, uh, mm -hmm. right to the point is great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sai. Thank you so much. Well, best, best wishes. Best of luck with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye.